Good afternoon, folks. Well, my name is David Ross. I'm one of I'm all the fires, but today I'm going to introduce this week um celebration of fifty years of fires. And this week today we're looking at the Northeast and and we're looking looking at various decades of and we're going to be looking at as I said, look at in the northeast and we're and we've got Simon Duffy, David Anderson, and Edom Lewis today as well to talk more about this. Before we, but before we hear from them, we want to tell you about what other key things that happened during the decade. So, in the year 2000, the, the same as you was, the same as, the same as you was published, it was written by the Scottish government. It looked at services for people with learning disabilities and people on the autistic spectrum. It said that people with learning disabilities and had the right to be included in and contribute to society and to have a voice and to have access with their families to support life and the life, live the life of their solution. It contained 29 recommendations intended to drive a train program to improve services. Also in this year, George W. Bush wins the presidential election in the United States of America. The fear, the fear millennium bug didn't crash the internet. And Denise Lewis, Steve Redgrave and Jonathan Edwards all took gold in the Sydney Olympics. 2001, the Scottish Social Services Council in, is launched to regulate, regulate social work, social care and early year workforce in Scotland. Also in this year, Tony Blair is re-elected as Prime Minister in the UK general election and the Twin Towers disaster happens and the Eden project is established in Cornwall. 2002 Free personal care for over 65 were established. The Care Inspectorate was established to look at the quality of care in Scotland to ensure it meets high standards where they find the improvement is needed. They support services to make positive changes. Lennox Castle Hospital finally closes its doors. Also in this year, the Falkirk Wheel opens. Brian May plays guitar on top of the Buckingham Palace to celebrate the Queen's Jub Golden Jubilee. And the Christmas number one is the sound of the underground by Girl Aloud. 2006. Changing Live Support was published. The 21st Century Social Work Review took 
a fundamental look at all aspects of social work and made recommendations on how services should be developed to meet the future needs of Scotland's people. In the same year, In Control Scotland was established. They work with organisations, health and social care partnerships and people across Scotland to support the development of a sustainable system of self-directed support. They provide training, development and consultancy and share what they learn to improve the experience of self-directed support for everyone. And also in this year, the BBC announces it will be facing out grandstand. Pluto is downgraded to a dwarf planet and Italy wins the World Cup in Germany. And finally, 2009, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, CRPD, is the International Human Rights Treaty, which sets out the human rights of disabled people. CRPD was adopted by the United Nations General, General Assembly on the 13th of December 2006 and has been rectified by 177 countries. The UK ratified the CRPD in 2009. Also in this year, the Carlman Report was published by Susan, Susan, Susan Boyle's first album, I Dreamed a Dream becomes Amazon's best-selling album in pre-sales. Now, as I conclude to, and can I introduce Dr. Simon Duffy and David Anderson and Adam Lewis to the call, please. And the three, the three wonderful people will have their I was meant to talk about what else happened in the decade. So I'll hand it over to these three honourable people. <laughs> Thank you, David. Um, three honourable people, yes, well, hopefully. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, my name is Simon Duffy, and um, I believe I was chair of Values Into Action Scotland subcommittee, I think, of, of Values Into Action. Uh, which uh, we've been talking about in the previous sessions. We have a lot to live up to. I've watched every single one of the sessions about the 70s, 80s and 90s, and they gave a really good introduction to uh, what was originally the campaign for people with a mental handicap, and when, which went on to become Values Into Action, and how that developed. But, but what we're mostly focusing on now is the developments in Scotland um, sadly, values into action in England um, eventually um, didn't continue, um, but values into action Scotland has gone from strength to strength. Um, and a lot of the kind of changes took place in the decade with this rather horrible name of the noughties. Um, so um, I, I'm going to ask David and Idem to, um, in a moment, to kind of introduce themselves a little bit and to explain how they got involved in Values Into Action Scotland. But I thought I'd just start by also reminding people of some of the the things that went alongside um, the things that David Ross has mentioned, because David mentioned the very important policy, the same as you, question mark. I never figured out what the question mark was for, um, but <laughs> this... This policy was was arrived in Scotland just after the formation of the Scottish Parliament and Scottish Government properly, which was in 1999, and which was because the Scottish people had voted in 1997 uh, for a fully devolved Scotland. 
um, with tax raising powers. Um, but there were other things going on which, which we didn't talk about in the earlier sessions, which were more focused on England, specifically in Scotland. So I thought I'd just mention some of those things because I think they are important in trying to understand maybe why Values into Action Scotland um, has continued. Because I think Scotland uh, has had some really good things going on and a lot of positive energy that has continued over the last 20 or so years. And I think we should remember some people and things. Um, I, I remember the, the person who I, I, I always think of we should, who's still there and fighting, it, it, that, but it needs to be remembered a lot more than he is, I think is John Dalrymple. I, I came to Scotland in 1995 and turned up at a hospital, Lennox Castle Hospital, which John was responsible with Julie Murray for leading the closure programme, um, looking for a job. And, and then John basically said, well, we don't have a job for you, but you could, maybe we, you could set up a service provider to help people get out of the hospital. And so that led to me setting up Inclusion Glasgow. And that led to other things like Sea Change for Inclusion, Partners for Inclusion, Neighbourhood Networks, Support for Ordinary Living. So in the end of the 90s, I think one of the interesting things that was happening was there were a lot of new service developments who were focused on kind of inclusion, person-centered planning, um, really respecting the individual, took, drawing on a lot of the things that uh, John O'Brien was talking about in, in his session on the 1980s. Um, I think other important people around at the time, Anne O'Brien um, was working a lot with North Lanarkshire Council on supported employment. Peter Kinsella, who is another really important person was working with councils, particularly again, North Lanarkshire Council on supported living, which meant people leaving the institutions, not into group homes, but people leaving into their own homes. In many senses, what was happening in Scotland was that many of the lessons were being learned because Scotland was a bit slower to close its institutions, but when it closed them, it tended to raise the standards compared to what was going on in England um, and, and draw out the best practice and try and push boundaries further. I think that other important people were Scottish Human Services, Pete Ritchie, Heather Ritchie, who did really important work in, in raising the profile of person-centered planning and the whole inclusion agenda. And they were very much behind a lot of the changes that ended up being in the, in the same as you. Um, and there were really interesting organizations like Grampian Service Brokerage and uh, around as well. And and a great partner for Values into Action Scotland was People First Scotland. So during that period, People First Scotland had already established itself as a really strong voice for self-advocacy. And so Values into Action really had to work kind of in partnership with, with them. Um, so for me, I got involved, I think, because John Dalrymple again kind of said, you know, it, as, the, as we started to see that there would be proper government for Scotland, representative government for Scotland, based in Edinburgh. We needed to strengthen the voice for inclusion. And so we started to think about how values into action become, could become stronger and, and have a bigger voice. And, and I think that's eventually, we might touch on some of those issues, but that's how I got involved. David, maybe Edem's just popped off. David, maybe you'd like to say how you got involved in Values into Action Scotland. Can you hear me? Good. Um, very quickly, I, I think I'm part of the prehistory of all this. I trained as a psychiatric social worker in 1961, if you can believe it. And through the 60s, of course, uh, things were difficult. Um, my first experience was just m meeting people in hospitals. But then I went to work with family service units, which showed that it was possible to support people in the community uh, who had serious disabilities. And quite a, quite a number of the families had parents who, who would have been classified as having a mental handicap, as they talked about it in those days. Um, so when I went to Scotland 
to Dingleton Hospital in the Borders, which curiously uh, also had at a later stage both uh, John Dalrymple and Dennis Rowley as social workers. So there's, a, there's quite an important kind of source here. Um, we were familiar with the idea of the hospital as a therapeutic community, but Dingleton in those days set about providing the care in the community, stopping people going into the hospitals. And that focus of a community service where people were living their ordinary lives with appropriate backup has always been uh, central for me. Um, I went south after my period at Dingleton and was um, assistant director in Cambridge in that key period just after Seabohm. And my job as a planning director was to kind of try and anticipate things, see how things moved forward. And um, learning difficulties, uh, as the term then was, came in. And um, I think I got drawn into the fringes of Bayer um, shortly after I left Cambridge Shire and went freelance, still in Cambridge. So um, in, in uh, 1980, I think it was, Peter Durrant, who was a social worker there, asked if he and I could write a book about social work and mental handicap. Um, Baswa were wanting to do one. And uh, we found we couldn't work together because we had such different ideas. And rather to my embarrassment, Baswa picked up my version and that's how the social work and mental handicap, I don't know, if it, don't know if this is visible, but this was published in 1982. And uh, I think it's quite well written, except that the terminology all changed just after I'd done it. <laughs> so I was left exposed having used this term mental handicap, which I actually don't object to too much because I think a handicap is not something as, that's part of somebody. I think it's something that society puts onto them. Um, anyway, uh, when I had when when I uh, decided to come up to Scotland, I got a, a part-time job at Dundee University as a social work lecturer. And of course, we were supposed to write things. And, but uh, one of my students said to me, You've written that book about mental handicap. You ought to be part of the local via branch. And it hadn't occurred to me, but I could see the logic. In, and in fact, that twinge of conscience is what got me into via. And I became a kind of member of the Dundee branch of uh, Values Interaction in Scotland. Now, when Scotland decided to go independent, in 1999, we decided um, in the Scottish branch that we ought to get a manifesto onto the desks of all new uh, MSPs, members of the Scottish Parliament, for those who are not familiar with it. And we produced this and, and sent it down to London because we couldn't do it without London's approval. And the London committee was in a bad state in those days. And they sat on it and managed to create a situation where we failed to get it on the desks of the, the new MSPs in time. It would otherwise have been the first document they saw. And we were really angry about that. Now we're talking about 1999, 1920. And we, we then began seriously to think, well, bugger them. We'd better get our own setup. We'd better get a Scottish values interaction. Well, of course, that VIA didn't like that very much and were not going to approve it. But it, eventually we got a grant, as I remember it, and took advice on how to break loose. And eventually in 2007, 
we registered Bally's Interaction Scotland with the Charity Commission. And that's when, you know, uh, past the midpoint of the noughties, um, VIAS officially came into being as an independent organization. And I, I, I was the secretary. I had already registered one charity, so I, I, I got landed with negotiating the uh, official bit of it. But that, that was my principal role. Um, and that's where this all begins, really, except to say that at that point, fire in London just collapsed in a heap. It was as if we'd kind of launched a lifeboat and the boat behind us chose to sink, which was very upsetting in some ways, but we we were happy enough in our lifeboat, I suppose. And from then on, we're all part of it. But that's how I got involved. Thanks, David. And that was a very good, actually, summary of some of the other developments. But Idem, do you want to introduce yourself and talk about how you got involved? And maybe you can touch up other details in David's story as you see fit. Can you release Edem from mutation? <laughs> Mutedness, that's it. Oh, Lily, there we go. Uh, hi there, my name's Edem Lewis, and I'm the, I'm the, I'm the, I've been involved in the um, five, um, um since the since the noughties, um I was um I was asked to um to be involved um when um, the former um when Fire had the director um of um um Jean Collins Dr. Jean Collins um was the director of um Fire uh, UK, um, they came to um, um, the head office of my social care provider and asked me if I wanted to to, to be part of the um, the, um, the committee in London, uh, and I agreed. And um, I went to um, um, because I've not been a plane, I've not been on a plane for uh, um, before. Uh, I've got my support worker to come with me to the um, um, uh, uh, to go on a plane from Glasgow Airport to London City Airport, and um, so I can take part because the, the meeting is on a Saturday, all day on a Saturday. Um, the, the, so the fire meetings was all uh, was was on on a all day on a Saturday, so we came on a Friday afternoon evening, and um, and had the um, hotel, the uh, hotel, the set hotel, uh, uh, Ibis Hotel, in Stratford, nearby Stratford Shopping Centre, and so so got um, so um, so so we got um, uh, so I remember the first one first I went which went to see um. We will rock you in London, in uh, West End, London West End, and we had food in Soho because the uh, I didn't have a uh, hot food or uh, um, um, so I had to go out for a meal. So, but because I not not been to London before at that point, I took a chance to go on the underground and seen um, um, one or two things with my support worker. So, um. So, and then, then I went on to uh, be involved in a Disability Rights Commission with uh, Eve that we saw yesterday's um, event. Um, and um, so, um, so, 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 so we, we, we were on um, 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 at fire uh, at, at, in London, it was, um, and then, um, um, and as David said, there was um, we, he didn't accept the Scottish having the Scottish Committee so, um, recommendation, and uh, and they had um, just like 
five five Scotland to have somebody lend us about to as um co chair with a professional and with quite a lot of people there. And um we met in Bethnal Green as it um but they didn't um did, and they were struggling to, to accept us and um but we had um in Scotland um um unfortunately she couldn't come today um to the to event with Julia Curry. Um we were hoping to come to couldn't come um uh, we had to employed for ten hours a week at least on twelve hours a week. Um, to do the Scottish um, fires, um, and then um, and that for then we got money from Steve said um, money for the um, to to get a plan to get um, um so that um, fires will be a lot better and, and plan for a future ahead of um, um, and and uh, we got money from the TSB Lloyds. I think it was with Lloyd's Foundation, um, and we met in Glasgow, and that, um, and, and that meant um, we got we, we got the money for we, then we got the money from Lloyd's to to make fires stronger, better, and then and then we then um, then um, when we, that meant that um, we could um, uh, employ employ staff. And and we can employ a um a, somebody with more hours, and that's how we, we employed Norma. So we, we, we've got um 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 a chief report, a chief executive, um, and um, so and then then it, then it, that opened doors, and then we employed lots more people after Norma. Um, but before that, um, what well, that happened, um, because fire in UK, uh, as David said, found it difficult to accept devolution because we had we found powers in this in Scotland and we found it difficult to different it was difficult then and then Queen left, Queen Collins left, and so we got somebody else in. I think they struggled, and then the um. Um, and then um, some one, one of the the personal lenders built to go to was not won't go live unfortunately, and then it struggled, and um, to to, to um, maintain uh, the existence and um, and said we, we and then um, we we got we got um, um, Fire Scotland in two thousand six, as we already mentioned, um, and um, um, so um, as we've seen, we're going to see tomorrow. There's lots of things that's it's it happened um, since those times. Days, but today, um, um, it, it, um, we, um, we pointed people and. Um, and um, we, um, we, um, and to focus on employment and um, uh, normal, normal uh, was when the first um, I was on interview panel that I think David was there as well um, to to an appointed normal and then from first day normal came keen on uh, employment being the heart of fires and that's been like that to this day and um, and. Um, and um, and and we've got more initiatives and more um, things happening as it, um, as the years went on, and um, and um, uh, as well we found difficult to uh, um, it shouldn't happen. We, we, then we we had um, we got our board of directors. I just got board of directors. And me and John De Rimpel was co-chair of the. The fires to board of trustees, and we've always struggled to get um, um, enough people on the board. But we, we are uh, for the last two or three years, we've got um, we've got yeah, last year or two, we've got um, 50 50 of 
people in this world is autism and professionals on the board of directors now and um and so um we got um um and we got um a deputy chief executive with Norma now so um so things that things are on um on up and um and um we uh, we we've all we've we 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 did um have um meetings in, in Perth and um and and we've uh, got an office in Hillington and um and so um before the pandemic um so uh, we don't go to and uh, Aberdeen but we don't go to Perth now um much and we meet um um uh, so we're meeting online since the pandemic. So I think um uh, actually, uh, I think um 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 I think that's all I can think of at the moment. So that's brilliant, Ed, um, yeah. And that so that that also fills in some of the details from David's story and takes us up to that point where values into action Scotland in a way like it's interesting how this has developed, um, but that focus on employment, um, I think, was something that people felt was really missing in a lot of the positive changes that were going on in Scotland. Employment was not really being brought to the top of the agenda. So, in a way, values into Action Scotland, and I guess maybe Norma and others will talk about this tomorrow in the in the Friday session, but has become like. The biggest, strongest part of Values into Action Scotland's work in the 2010s, hasn't it? Yeah. In this in in this period in the noughties, we were yeah. There was a lot of struggles to um, achieve independence, and and one of the questions that um, was put in the comments. I I know that we've got questions later, but I do think that the manifesto is really cool as well. I remember we we worked really hard at actually trying to say in a way it was a bit of a response to this um yeah you know, thinking of thinking about the rights of people as rights that everybody has and trying to make sure that we thought about everybody as citizens um but the first three sentences of the manifesto are via in scotland believes that the scottish parliament should change the laws and regulations so that people with learning difficulties get treated fairly. At the moment, there are lots of laws and policies that don't work well for people with learning difficulties. I in Scotland believes that the changes listed below will help to give people with learning difficulties the same rights as everybody else. And then we had these different categories. So we talked about education, health, home life, work, housing, and freedom and um and there are really important things in here about which still big issues today aren't they um about people's right to have a child um but also people not being encouraged to have abortions the things about eugenics uh that we were challenging then and things about supported living people having the right to their own home just like everybody else support to have a job support for inclusive education so it was a real manifesto for inclusion and equal citizenship i think um and uh yeah as david said it was frustrating that i i don't know that it was problems with the manifesto it seemed like often it was just difficult for the english based group which was i suppose via uk but it was really very based in the south of England, um, it was difficult for them to have enough mental time to think about Scotland. I can remember going down to meetings uh, to represent by in Scotland, and there would be a long agenda, and it was all about valuing people, which was the English policy document. And people would have really interesting debates on these things, but they just weren't relevant in Scotland. And then we were sitting on the bottom of the agenda. And then actually what would happen is they wouldn't even get to us. So you'd have gone all the way down to London, which is an awful long way. I mean, it's nice if you can go and 
watch a, a good musical or something. But uh, for me, I found it very frustrating, um, really, to go through. I fe- and it did feel a bit insulting, I suppose. And I know that wasn't the intention. Like, so these are good people. Uh, they didn't mean to hurt people's feelings at all. Um, but it, I suppose it's one of those frustrating issues when we live in this very centralised country, don't we? And I mean, one of the other questions that's already come up is, about, you know, would this have happened without a Scottish Parliament? Um, and I think that maybe it wouldn't. It was the opportunity to talk to our own politicians directly. Uh, I remember very well, uh, it was a really nice moment, 10 years after the creation of Inclusion Glasgow, this is in 2006, we had a conference celebrating Inclusion Glasgow's work and Nicola Sturgeon, who wasn't First Minister at the time, came as a local MP. And it was great to talk to somebody like that who really was interested in what you were doing and could see it. And um, I don't see I don't see that relationship to politics in England, actually, but in Scotland, it feels more a bit more human, and it makes sense to organise and to connect. I think. And I yeah, think if that- I can, chip, if I can just chip in, uh, Jackie Bailey is another name um, of somebody we should give credit to, a uh, Labour politician. But I mean, she chaired the the uh, parliamentary group, uh, and actually, I think she chaired the launch, which was in the Parliament. And worth just remembering that the manifesto was actually, in the end, published by VIA London. So the Scottish manifesto was published by London because VIA in Scotland didn't have a a voice at that time. And like you, I remember uh, um, James, James West, who who was our chair up here, going down uh, and spending the whole meeting. Um, and then not getting to the final item, which was the Scottish one, just as you say. So we, we, we owe Via a lot for having fought the fight in England, but they were inadequate in Scotland. And that's the whole point about Scottish independence, isn't it? If we move the conversation on a bit from that, to just what was going on in Scotland, what what we think of as the big, what were the big challenges and achievements of the noughties, do you think, Edem and David? Maybe Edem, do you, what do you, in that period, aside from all the politics, what, what were we fighting for, do you think? Uh, I, I, I should, we went for, um, um, um having more rights because people ended up having more rights than um and thought and being thought by politicians because then um, because we had the Scottish Parliament and we it was just new and um and we um and it and um it was decent um I think um having more, more freedom well, more, um, you know, independence or something. Um, so it's just, um, 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 yeah, I, I think, I think, I think the Scottish Parliament was a chance to, that people, so that people in this party can, can have a voice, sort of thing, no like, to have a voice and we can have, and, and be part of communities and, um, and um, and and be part of society that um, and um, that wouldn't have happened if it wasn't a Scottish um, Parliament and being and being um, 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 you know I'd be a part of something right now we're part of decision making and we're um, and be included in things um, that you know, wasn't didn't happen before the Scots Parliament. And David, what do you remember as the kind of the challenges and the fights in policy terms? Uh, it, it was a period when I had just retired, technically, from Dundee University 
but they went on employing me to provide training in Romania and Ukraine. So my mind was somewhere else most of the time, I'm afraid. But I, I think we shouldn't forget that the hospitals were still there. I mean, you mentioned John at Lennox Castle. Dennis was working to, to, for the closure of Gogoburn, the, Ed, the Edinburgh Hospital, and that was still going on. And that, of course, meant um, working out where people were going to live in the community, devising new structures. <clears throat> thank, thank God John and Dennis were properly tuned into uh, alternative uh, living accommodation and things. I, I, my mind, uh, as I say, was somewhere else, really. Um, and I was rather preoccupied with uh, accommodation. So when Vias moved towards employment, I thought I really had come to the end of what I had to offer. And in about 2010, I think I resigned. I was already 75 then, so I was beginning to feel my bones creaking and my ideas too. So I, I, I think the 20, the, the noughties were about winding up uh, the old style of seclusion, shutting people away and work, tr beginning to work out what it meant to operate in the community. But of course, there was then a, a financial series of financial crises which made it harder and harder to implement the things that which uh, our values would have wanted implemented. And I think that struggle to make sure that what's created hasn't entirely been successful. So we've ended up with some really rather large um, organizations um, running hostile type accommodation, which is too big. And um, some of the work of getting people uh, established in their own homes has still to be done. Yes, and for me, the noughties was a time of lots of traveling, actually, because I, I, I think I was chair from about two, from 1999 to about 2002, I think. And then me and my family went back to the north of England, to Sheffield. Um, but I actually ended up, so then I start. and my big obsession in Scotland had been not just personalised support, but individualised funding and self-directed support. And I'd worked with a number of local authorities on that, but I couldn't actually in that period get much interest from the Scottish government. And then I ended up working in England on these ideas and creating in control. But by 2006, I was going back to John and Francis Brown and saying, hey, why don't you get this idea going in Scotland? And that became In Control Scotland. Uh, and, and actually, Scotland has ha had a very good track record. And things aren't perfect, but by international standards, it's had a very good track record in developing these new funding, self-directed support mechanisms. But as you say, David, the... The, the economic crisis, particularly from 2008-9, has, has made things a lot worse. And, 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 you know, a lot of my attention since has been on tackling austerity and trying to understand what what's driven austerity. And I guess one of the big questions for me is where advocacy organisations stand sometimes when we face these big challenges, especially when the challenges are in a way they're bigger than any one group. Like I think when, when, when you're fighting to close, say mental handicap institutions, hospitals, whatever we want to call them, it's kind of makes a lot of sense to focus. That's an obvious evil, let's eliminate it. But when you're fighting for social justice, fair funding, human rights, fighting against austerity, it's quite difficult when everybody's divided up into lots of little groups. <laughs> it, that, and that's how it feels a bit like in, in the United Kingdom, I think, that, um, that we're all a little bit too divided when it comes to these issues now. That we, that we, it's good for fighting 
very concrete evils to kind of go, right, let's roll up our sleeves and form this campaign group. But sometimes the evils are much bigger and, and harder to get at. So it's, it's, that's, I think, part of our challenge today. I don't know. Idem, what do you think were the, uh, the challenges and all the things that you're most proud of um, in Scotland today? What, what can Scotland be proud of and what do you think are the problems in Scotland today? You're, you're muted, Idem, still. The, the problems are, um, are um, I think, um, I, th I think we, we think we are, um, it's got, we've got lots, uh, they are, they are less, um, long the hospitals opening, there's, what's happening now, there's less day centres opening due to cuts that we've just been talking about, so people are, um, are so it's only, People with complex needs are maybe in day centres now. There's, there's, um, there's, um, basically there's, there's people starting to leave units, um, treatment assessment units. Um, beginning to um, the, the, the local authorities are are trying to work to get um, to to stop them um, to um, to. Uh, um, to reduce um, hospital data, uh, delay uh, discharges and and so and have people in the community um, it might not be the, um, um, like three bedrooms and fifteen bedrooms and all that sort of, but um, 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 but there's also there's um there's um a group and this is a Scottish wide group looking at um, alternative housing models for people who are um who who are um um who are in units or because we've got because um after the the same issue that we've got the coming home report which um because people had um weren't staying in their local areas there um and then um, and then um, so people so people will have their own homes in the communities or in, in places that they are um, they are they are familiar with or or they've got family nearby etc and um, and so so we are um we we come in we are, so they are um they um, so they are, they're, they're, they're doing that sort of thing so that's been going for for many years so 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 uh, that's happening, um, but it, because because of funding challenges, um, it means that um, this there is or there will be less support or the less priority for support for mild moderate learning disabilities and um, and Asperger syndrome, um, and and foot um, um, so um, um, and um, there's at the moment there's um, Next year, maybe there's going to be um, um, tech enabled supports that's happening. So that may be technology enabled support, um, maybe initially sleepovers um, overnight, but there might be, events will be during the day as well. So that's going to be happening um, for people. There's um, the, um, the, 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 we had the pandemic and had Brexit, so the chances on supports. Um, the same funding for support staff or um, support workers, same um, etc. So that's happening. Um, um, but um, but um, we we want um, this. But but um, but it's an opportunity for for organisations like our own about to to employ a. Uh, People entering with autism in in the workplace, especially after, after a pandemic, like we've been talking about, and we we, we want to um, um to get um so people um, that um, people we have we've got aspirations we've we 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 are um, want to be um, not forgotten about and 
and um, and what be the you know a, you know um, be included in society um so um um so, so um so I think that I think that um there are challenges but they also um there's there's uh, there's, there's also um opportunities um 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 if we if we grasp it and 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 um and and we um uh, and, and and we show that um we we have um we have abilities and talents that um and um if uh, if they give us a chance thank you uh, no that's a brilliant and 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 hasn't values interaction scotland's employment program has been brilliant at focusing on that the gifts that people bring i wonder whether we could just go to questions now um liam do you think if if i'm um, just open it up because we've kind of covered what the flow of what happened and we talked about some of the topics so maybe people can just challenge us or question us or whatever you want to do that's absolutely fine yes so yeah we'll, we'll jump right into questions so these are questions from the public so they're from facebook platforms and also linkedin so our first question comes from john brown and here's what he has to say so again take it in turns or whoever wants to answer whoever may know who what the answer is just feel free to answer it so the first question comes from john and he says what was the dream back in 2006. <laughs> I don't know whose dream we're talking about here. I mean, the, the one term we haven't perhaps identified is normalization. And I, th I think from most people uh, who have some kind of learning difficulty, they just want a normal life. That has to be the center of the dream. And in each individual case, there'll be a different answer to that. In, in, in one case, it'll be, I want my mum and dad to regard me better or to stop fussing over me. In, in another case, it'll be, I'm trying to stand on my own feet, but people keep kicking their feet from under me. So I don't know if there was an overall dream I mean, 2006 is a very key date because it's when we finally got Values into Action Scotland is established. And from then on, as you said, there's been a lot of focus on it, getting employment, which I think it's done extraordinarily well. That would be my response. Okay. Um, should we move on to the next question? Does anyone else want to add on to that? Well, it, again, it's I like I at this point I was the Englishman, but I'll just add one little thing to to David's point because uh, David mentioned the launch of bias in the Edinburgh Parliament or the Scottish Parliament in Edinburgh, and that uh, hosted by Jackie Bailey, really important ally of the movement, and. Um, I just I dug out my speech that I gave. I was very I, if I, I actually have on a list of things I'm proud of. Being invited to give that speech was was is very high up and my dream, <laughs> but kind of a dream for Scotland was that Scotland became a community of citizens, and I I think that so for me beyond ordinary life, which for me is a it, it's obviously a good idea in lots of ways, but I think we need to actually have a slightly stronger vision and, and it's about everybody as a citizen and then that citizen is means everybody can be different and everybody can be equal which sounds like a paradox but it's not it's what a good community is like and in that equality we figure out how to look out for each other and i gave the example in that speech of denmark because in world war ii denmark unlike every other country in europe it actually saved 
Danish and non-Danish Jews from the Nazis. It organized itself as a community to protect people from harm. And that for me is what citizenship is about. And, and I guess that's still my dream <laughs> for what it's worth. <laughs> I don't know, Edom, I, can't, I think that's such a big question. You should say like, what was your, what's your dream? You've touched about it a little bit, but what is your dream or was your dream then? Um, well, it, 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 it was to make um, fires um, stronger, even stronger, and make it um, more relevant to um, to to people, and make sure that we were um, um, we're still going, and we wanted to, you know, you know, um, make it better. That's all I can think of. So. Okay, brilliant answers there, guys. So we've got a next question, and the next question comes in from The Life I Want. And they say, so apologies if it's quite a big question, so bear with me when I read this one out. So how do you feel when Values Into Action finally closed its doors? Do you think there will, there will always be a need for organisations like Values Into Action and Values Into Action Scotland? I don't like silences, but I don't like being the first to talk every time. Uh, can I just say, um, social work is another thing that's close to my heart. I was pl pleased in 1971 when social work went into uh, local government as a central part of it. And from then on, I think it lost its soul to some extent. Because I think social work is not about the provision of services just. It's fundamentally about tackling uh, situations where people are being regarded as misfits, what I would call anomaly. When somebody is trapped in an anomaly, that's where social work should be. So it should always be fighting government because government is for the majority by definition. They might argue about that. but And I think social work, um, and I'd put via in that context, uh, we, we need organizations like that that can tackle the next anomaly. Let me stop there or I'll go on forever. <laughs> I was very sad when Vi Values Into Action closed. It was the organization that I joined in a way when I discovered this world. It was, the, it was an organization that I as a citizen could join to uh, represent the values of inclusion that I discovered. And I'd only discovered as an adult after leaving university and then working with people with learning difficulties and being blown away by, I guess, how brilliant they were, how unjust the system was, and there was values into action as something you could join. I mean, you, you wouldn't join MenCap <laughs> from, from my point of view. Um, and uh, so I'm sad when things like that break down. And um, yeah, and do we always, well, I mean, I guess, the only point at which we wouldn't need such institutions is if we lived in a totally just society. And that doesn't seem like it's a risk we're running at the moment. Um, I think that there are important points about how these organizations function. Uh, I think the emergence of self-advocacy is really important. You know, when um, we actually, we've been publishing essays about the early days of self-advocacy and interviews with self-advocates exploring the very early days, um, actually before even people first. And um, But as people become self-advocates, then things should change because they must be in the driving seat. But I don't think, and I think history is bearing us out, that if we just leave self-advocacy to, to do all the work, 
then that won't work either because too many other people have power and money. And um, so we've not really worked out how to organize advocacy in this in the United Kingdom, um, I think, to stick up for people properly. Uh, and that's, I think, David's point about social work is, is connected here because many institutions have actually been corrupted by becoming a bit too close to government, by taking a bit too much money from government, and then they can't speak freely. And so, I mean, it's a big question. So I think that it deserves lots more debate, actually, the whole like, whole problem. Well, you should, you should add, though, that at that point, organisations should end. I mean, I've been thinking a lot more about how you die recently. I feel about 30, but at 85, I've, I've got to think about it. And organisations should be prepared to go out of existence once they've done their job. But they rarely recognise that they have done their job because there's always mopping up to do. Okay. Thanks, guys. Um, so we'll move on to our next question then. And again, we've got two questions from the Life I Want. So this is their second one, and then we'll get on to the rest. So the last question from the Life I Want, and here's what they have to say. So what if Scotland hadn't gotten its own parliament? Do you think things would have been different? Mm. Yeah, I'll start then. Um... Yeah, I think um, things will be different um, with, with what we mentioned earlier that um, 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 if, if devolution didn't happen, I think would um, there's a possibility that um, fire in London would possibly remain and um, a and um, and we wouldn't we, we wouldn't be where we are today, um, um, and um, um, as um, as um, things were, um, all policies were controlled by Westminster, um, um, so I think um, yet um, having a Scots Parliament, even very limited powers in the ninety uh, nine um was the start of um of um of um having um a, a foot in the door for fires in Scotland and um and um and um and I said that earlier it was um I think if fire in London was find it difficult as a result of that. So yeah, the Scottish Parliament has made um a big difference on, on how we how how, uh, how we are today. Thank you. Okay. Oh Simon you're talking there. When when I came to Scotland in ninety five, I'd been I'd been at university in Edinburgh, but I returned with Nicola and my wife in ninety five. And one of the things, and maybe this is a bit too simplistic, but it, what it felt like is that a lot of policies like deinstitutionalization, uh, Scottish people sometimes felt that these policies were being pushed by London. And so they would be resisting things that, that, should, <laughs> that should be accepted because they seemed like English policies. And I know that, I mean, that's just maybe my impression. And that's all changed now. Like, so Scotland knows that it is actually leading the way. It's the country that will introduce more progressive policies and it knows it's doing it for itself. And that's one of the great things about self-government. You're not reacting to other people's agendas. You're creating the local agenda. So not everything's perfect in Scotland by a long mark, but in most areas of disability policy, Scotland is better and by a good degree and it's better because people locally have decided that's the policy we want to follow and then they're committed to it rather than you know with a with a london dominated system everything comes like somebody else's idea and and when you're reacting to somebody else's idea you're always tending to be a little bit more negative i think 
Yeah, I think it's the difference between catching a bus to Edinburgh or catching a plane to London. I mean, if you catch a plane to London, you have so many things to think about. You haven't really got your full focus. Go down to Edinburgh, you can walk straight into the Parliament. That's another simplest, simplistic thing. Access is so much better. Um, you can identify individual people and go and see them. What, is, what do you think, David? Uh, I've kind of gone with what you've already said. Uh, I think it would be completely different. And I think if Westminster there wasn't, no, if uh, Scottish Parliament wasn't the way it was, and we didn't have that, I think it would be a completely different world. And Scotland, wouldn't, I don't think, would be where it is today. And I think, as well, fires wouldn't be leading on from fire. I think we're, we're having the background of fire and having people that were and are still connected are backing, I've got the backing of fires as well. And being able to have that and having the Scottish government kind of helps a little. Okay, sorry, before I before before we move on to the next question, does anyone else want to add on to that or do you want to just move on then? Sorry, because I might have butted in a few times there during that question. But anyway. So we'll move on to the next one then. So our next question then comes in from Natalie Clark from Facebook. And she says this. So why was employment chosen as a priority in this decade, the 2000s? Hmm. Um... I, I, I think um, I think we, I think we're focused on um, too much, we're, we're of, we're focused on getting people in the communities from long stay hospitals and having own independence in the community and so employment wasn't thought about we don't want to think about from at that time sort of thing we want about um, new chances in communities and and having housing in the community and because people have been in long term hospitals for for many years. So I think that's why um and and, and I think um a community uh, so 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 yeah getting people in the communities and getting people support in the community and then long and close to long term hospitals um and people having a voice um after that, um, within this political decision making, I think um, was the main focus, and we, we haven't thought about employment at that point. Thank you. I think you was exactly right that, like in the late nineties and through the noughties, the focus was very much on closing institutions, providing good housing housing innovations, support innovations, funding innovations, but jobs were not high on the list. With the exception of play, a few places, and Norma Curran was involved in a lot of this work, but uh, you know, places like North Lanarkshire where there was a big focus on employment and supported employment, but mostly it, was, it just slipped down the agenda. And, and I think that via in scotland i wasn't but i think what they were doing is saying well our role is to focus on if you like the horizon issue does that make like we've got a stretch and that's one of the things i think advocacy organizations always do have to do if they're not going to just run out of energy and die as david mentions they've got to identify what is the real challenge coming forward that we have to think about and i think i think they were right to think uh, employment was underrepresented as a key advocacy issue. 
I think that's dead right. I, I, I was on the interview panel when we got the grant to employ a full-time worker. And I, I can't honestly say that we had a policy of looking for somebody who was uh, into employment. We, we were uh, dead lucky in a, in a sense that we found Norma just at that moment. Uh, I doubt if we said anything about employment in the job description. Uh, but she came absolutely full of it. She knew where to, where to go. And it, it suddenly seemed as if that was the natural next avenue for, for Vias. I mean, that's maybe that's just that I was blind and ignorant about it all. But that's what it felt like for me. If Norma came, uh, the focus changed. I realized you know, I was out of my depth. I had nothing really to offer in that area. Well, very little anyway. But I was delighted that she took it off in that uh, direction. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for those answers there. So our next question comes in from Andrew Holman. And apologies, it's quite a big question, so some of your cameras might be hidden. Oh, no, doesn't do anything there. But anyway, Andrew says, so it's a question for you, Simon, actually. So, Simon, you say you say easier to campaign when focus is on a particular subject, like the old hospitals, but why then have we been so ineffective and short, shorting assessment and treatment centres? Yeah, as ever, Andrew, you, when you and I talk, I always think we feel slightly miss each other. I wasn't saying it was easier to come back in on these things. I suppose when when there's a particular evil, was my point, campaigning has a particular style and people can kind of organise around that uh, issue. And, um, and some problems, like austerity, have a different style and require a different kind of campaign and so that structures that we developed in the 60s 70s and 80s suddenly don't seem to work so well with a different kind of challenge that was my point i mean interestingly in terms of scotland the there is a, a much smaller problem but a similar problem in scotland and john darrymple as ever is organizing at the moment a campaign under uh, the title Radical Visions for Social Care um, and so people are organising in Scotland specifically on that issue and, and it is interesting to think about why England has been so bad at organising on that issue and, and certainly I wonder whether if Values Into Action had worked out how to survive it might have been a really good issue to focus on. There have been several campaigns on that issue however but they, they all seem to tend to kind of um, collapse in on themselves or, or become very diffuse, is my observation. I mean, even the Centre for Welfare Reform has campaigned on this issue and continues to make a fuss. Um, we've even gone to Parliament and made a fuss about it. But, yeah, we're not having an impact, that's for sure. And I think it's really, I mean, it's a big question. Why, why are we failing to have an impact on a whole range of issues, I think is a very good question. So I'll shut up at this point. Thank you very much, Simon, for answering that. Um, our next question comes in from Norma Curran again. And here's what Norma has to say. So Norma says, do you think that the values element of support staff training is not as good or better to do who feels up to answering that it's a hard question norma depending on your knowledge base edem do you have any experience of this david do you have any david ross do you have an experience of staff training oh, I, come in, um, I think um, um, I think it felt well, it worked uh, in the in the north as well is that um, um, in, in early, the early uh, late nineties is that we um, 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 people learn difficulties and 
or you know, a part of, of well, or um, getting involved in staff training for their care providers and starting to be included, and then on to professional organisations. Um, so, so I think the, um, it, I think um, tends to be more inclusive than that, that, um, in Washington and um, and um, and uh, on to present. So it means that the the the, the professional organisations are, are are keen on um, having us to train their staff and um, asking us to and pay and and pay them sort of thing um, uh, and pay the, 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 the for the training to the individuals who are doing it. I think that's and that's another success that um, that we haven't talked about yet. Um, so that so that didn't happen uh, prior to Scottish Parliament half um, and um, as well. So um, so we see an inclusive um, workforce and and more and take part in interview panels and um, and and or, um, and um, just just like. The right workers and um, um, and and um, so that's happening as well now. So um, so I, I think um, uh, yeah, I, I think um, the, to answer the question, I think uh, I think staff are, are, um, are I think uh, are better um, the when the needs of the 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 um, that the people that they're what they're, they're working for. Thank you. I know from, I, I was going to say what I know from, when I went when I when I went for the interview with Fires. I I, I I don't know if you remember Edom. Mm. You were a part of the interview panel on the day of my interview. Mm, yeah. And and prior to on the day I, I, my interview was done at two parts. I'll interview I'll, well, if you remember um, Edward and yeah. Norm Dakota yeah. Margaret. Yeah. Then yourself with Norma and Liz. Yeah. And I think I think it really depends on the organisation if and what works for them. And then if the individual is being interviewed, how they how they end up, if how they take what their take on the questions are, and well, almost eight years with five now. Mm. Um, and of and again for me, it's, I always seem to get get better if we know what we're looking for and what uh, what others are looking for. Thanks very much, David. And you have to continue talking, David Ross, because the next question is actually for you, David. So um, and again, it's from Norma. So David, you were growing up in the noughties, so the 2000s. What was school life like for you? Oh, again, school, school wise, it was, it was times it was tough because I was purely because I've got a disability and a lot of folk didn't understand. I was, I went in there, I was in a, I don't know if it allowed to say, but I went into yeah, yeah, special needs skill, and that was there was times that was tough, but out the personal life, oh, there was times that was tougher because where, where I stayed, it wasn't there was a lot of folk that kind of if they've seen you as different, they. They treated you differently, and they were like. But thankfully, 
after all so long because I was kind of really like keeping myself to myself. See, I kind of got to see, I think that some people that were then genuinely caring and thought would be like, I've not seen him for, I've not seen him for ages, but and they started being really nice and being a lot more caring. And and then and then people were like starting to be David. What about this? What about that? Do you want to do this? Do you want to do that? And the more they included me and treated me like a normal human being. Well, when I say normal, what what is the normal? Get being treated such as an ordinary human being was what I saw everybody wants and being able and being able being able to be treated like a normal a normal person helped a lot. And again, sorry um uh uh, as a when I turned sixteen, not only did I have the skill, I'd also end up having the weekend work as well. And again, when I felt comfortable telling management that I had disabilities, they were kind of a lot better. They were being a bit. They were included. They were including me and, and treated me a bit better. And we were able to um, put things e- across easier or better. Thanks very much, David, for that question there. Um, so our, we've got one question for you, David Anderson, from The Life I Want. So apologies if it's quite a big question, if we can't see David Ross's camera a little bit there. But for you, David, um, for David Anderson, we'd love to know what you think about the current social work, the lack of engagement and advocating of skills of of, um, SDS. Are they just too poor? Sorry, are they just too time poor? Or is it more deep rooted? Uh, you may have to stop me on this one. Um, I'm out of the fray now. I, I don't uh, see very much of social work, but then I, I suspect that's true for people who need it. Um, I do think social work has lost its way. Uh, the social service departments, or up here the social work departments, have been torn apart. Um, social workers are scattered through other sections of local government. Um, in itself, that's no bad thing. But I think social workers, or quite a lot of social workers, feel they've lost something. And of course they have. They've lost their own home base. It did feel as if you know we were on a par with health and education and roads uh, when we had the big departments. But I think we got tangled up in just providing more ordinary services. And I, I, I think that should be left to other people. Once, uh, once we know what services should be provided, then I think it's up to uh, the relevant bits of the government to get on and do it and i think social work should should now should probably always be a kind of task force that's choosing its own targets but identifying itself with the people who are not getting the service (laughs) and by not getting the service i don't mean because there aren't there isn't enough money but because people don't recognize a need so uh, uh, I, d- I do feel sad about 
the state of the profession which I've been in since 1958, Christ. Um, it, it does seem to be to, to me to be in a worse state than it was then, because then at least it was kind of live and fighting and had some balls. I think now it's been emasculated. You be, I better stop because I could go on forever <laughs> on this one. It just it just gave me a memory, David, of, of a, an event we ran with John Darrymple a, a few years ago when we gathered together social workers. And it was a very strange thing because we had a room full of social workers, all people qualified as social workers. And half of the group were working for local government. They said they were qualified as social workers, but they didn't feel that they were doing social work. And the other half of the group were qualified social workers who were working in the voluntary sector. And they said, we're qualified as social workers, but we don't feel we can call ourselves social workers. I think that's a pretty problematic situation for a profession when all the people qualified with it in a way can't use the arts and the name and the identity. So just really echoing David, but it was very striking to me that sense that it's a profession that's lost its way. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, guys. I am a bit cautious of the time because we've only got four minutes left because obviously you guys want to go to closing statements, but we do have one last question. So I guess we'll, we'll wrap this last one up pretty quick and then we'll move on to the closing statements from everyone here today. So our last question comes from Davey McDonald, and he says, do you think towards the end of the 90s when the national minimum wage started, it was a turning point for people with disabilities to move into mainstream employment? I'm going to say one thing because I, I feel like I might, I, as far as I can see, the data for people with learning difficulties for the UK is still extremely poor. <laughs> so if it's a turning point, it's not a point we seem to have turned very far down, I would say, Davey. But I might be missing something and I don't know the Scottish specific data. Okay. Brilliant. So does anyone want to add on to that or do you want to just quickly move on to closing statements today? I, I can't. Not, no, no worries then. So obviously, thank you everyone on Facebook for commenting. We're now going to be moving on to closing statements. So it's just a way for everyone on the panel just to say thank you. Yeah. Well, anybody want to start? I can start you and just start. say, yeah, I, I just want to say a big thank you to Values Into Action Scotland for um, for hanging on in there, for doing more than hanging on in there, to actually establishing themselves in such a brilliant way, and for running this series. And I suppose I do feel like our history is really, really, really important. I think it, it does as a world of good to see what we've achieved, what we haven't achieved, what what we've learned along the way and so I, and I'm I'm very grateful for your work and for having played a little part in its development and for this opportunity so thank you I'd, I'd like to say the same uh, it, it seemed a bit of a shock when I heard that we were celebrating 50 years and of course we ought to be celebrating far more than that because via was established in 71. But campaign for the mentally handicapped had been going on quite a while before that. So it is a bit of history that is worth celebrating and I'm pleased to have been part of that. Uh, um, I'd, like to, I'd like to thank um, everyone for listening um, and watching this. Um, watching this um, I, I, I'm, I'm very proud to be part of the success of fires um through the notice to the, the present and um and and um, and all of, all the all the things that we've achieved together during that time and um and um and the Dale Scots Parliament ha has has made it uh, made that more more uh, possible um to, to to do that um uh, and um 
Uh, and finally, I'd like to thank all the um, all the, um, the people past and present um, to be part of FIRE's um, creation over the years. And um, and um, and we wouldn't have um, um, achieved our success without you all. So thank you. And I know for myself and I know on behalf of myself and behalf of Fires, thank you very much to yourself, Simon, David and Needham for being the panelists today. And I hope you enjoy the as you are involved tomorrow. It'd be great to see you all tomorrow as well. And the same for everyone everyone watching today's podcast podcast hope to see you all tomorrow and thank you liam yes thank you liam no worries it's absolutely fine so thank you everybody thank you david ross thank you simon duffy thanks edom and also david anderson and we'll see you all very soon thanks for tuning in for today thank you